So hello everybody. Welcome Ilaria. <laughs> We're waiting for you. Yes. Yes, now we will start. So good afternoon everybody. Thanks for being here. It's not easy to find it. I know it's also a long week. Some people have left already, but we have also quite some participation online. So very happy and pleased to be here. Pleased to have uh, this wonderful panel as well. So I will just say a few words on the setting of this side event. We don't have so much time, but I hope it can have a nice discussion. For the people who are in the GFOI meeting, we have been talking all the time on mitigation mainly, although we also heard quite some adaptation popping up, but we didn't really tackle it. So I, I'm extremely grateful to have the colleagues of OCB who have done um, a lot of work on this, and so they will share with us what also been done in agriculture to see uh, what's there for forest and how we can tackle this. Um, so we've been talking about better data, better decisions. We've talked a lot about all the data available. Uh, we hear also a lot about the AI. The, the idea is, do we get better decisions because we have a better data? Uh, for the adaptation, the, one of the outcomes was that there's still so much work to be done. So the, really the efforts on adaptation should be really popped up. And so that's also one of the examples of the top CCOs, which I think um, Antonio will talk about. So one of the questions also in this whole meeting was a lot on definitions. So what is a forest? What is mitigation? What is adaptation? So I just took the IPCC um, definition. So adjustment in natural human systems in response to actual or expected climatic stimuli or their effects, which moderates harm or explodes beneficial opportunities. So it says a lot and it also say it's very abstract. So we're going to go into detail and Elisa and Marcel will talk about what they've been doing. So the monitoring, um, not too much about all the money, the funding for people who are following the COPs and also the negotiations. So you might know that the funding has scaled up since Glasgow. Um, the adaptation needs, although so, um, following the UNEP report, they say that there's a real lot of billions needed without going to detail how much. We need a lot of money, let's say. And then the tracking of progress, the monitoring systems and the adaptation measures, there's a really gap and a clear mandate. So this is also why under supervising of uh, Amy Duchel in the forest and climate team. This is a new work stream we really want to explore and see what we can offer to the countries and what the countries are already doing, so how we can collaborate. Um, so we heard a lot on the NFMS systems, um, also the adaptation. We have that m &E system, so monitoring and evaluation to see where country stands, what they would need it. Uh, Anto Antonio is going to talk about what's already available. We all know that remote sensing can play a role there, um, but as also said before, there's a lot of data. What can we do and how can it be linked? So why FAO? So for people who were in the GFOI meeting, you heard maybe already too much about open forests. So let's say in a nutshell, and for countries working with it, so I, I know also Uganda has worked with it. So we have these open forest suite of modules won't go into all the details. Some of you have been in CPAL events. There was EarthMap, the Collect Earth. So there's a lot of tools. It's all freely available, can be downloaded. There can be support with it. Um, so hopefully also for the adaptation, uh, we can tweak and come up with modules which really fit the country needs. So CPAL, I won't talk about it because you heard it a lot. People who really want to know more, please come and see me, but I think everybody knows about it. You can also see all these logos, so it's not our own thing. It's really a collaboration. Um, we're not a research institute, so we collaborate with academia on this. And then all the different platforms. So we heard this as well. Uh, we heard on the UNFCCC, we had about the standards, so countries you, the countries here, know they have to report to so many different frameworks. Uh, very often there's data which for the different frameworks is generated differently. One of the things at least FAO wants to help with is to have one uh, source of data who then can report to all the different um, frameworks, which of course would be a better way of using money. So the wish list so adaptation, um, what can we do? So I hope to hear a bit more on what has been done, especially for the agriculture. Uh, we're talking a lot in this whole meeting on the change in land cover and use. We heard also from some countries, they want to have more on the soil properties because we're not only talking about the above ground biomass. So remote sensing with long data records um, to see what was in the past and also what's gonna be in the future. And then also the help with the public and the private, also for adaptation, most likely that's gonna be an issue. 
So then why do we think for FAO, at least we can try to help you in case there's a need? Because I said also in the meeting this week, I think FAO only wants to come up with things that are useful for countries. Otherwise, our role is redundant. So um, the adaptation monitoring in the NAP, so we have done a study. So Antoine is also here, Antoine Liber. So there has been a study to see how much m and &E is already in existing NAPs. And so based on that, to see really a new area of work to build on existing platforms and the file tools in order to help countries to also uh, monitor adaptation. So I said proof of concept to be developed. So we will work in some pilot countries, but again, that's not how it's going to implement and impose. It's up to really needs of countries to contact us and to work with us on that. I think this is my last slide. So um, now we have a few presentations and I think we're a bit short on time because of the short break. So we're gonna have first Elisa from OCB. She's gonna talk what they have been doing on agriculture adaptation. So this is yours. So he's here to yes. go. Thanks for the introduction. Twice, yes, sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, Good afternoon uh, to everybody. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I will be giving a short overview of the work we have been doing under two ICI program. Um, in the, we we will start the work on monitoring evaluation for adaptation under the NAPAG Integrating Agriculture and National Adaptation Plan program, and then we are continuing under the current program Scala, as you can read, scaling up climate ambition in land use and agriculture to NDC and NAPS. Um, our journey started with the development of this uh, technical guidance note uh, to guide countries on strengthening their m and &E systems at national level to report on agriculture. And for agriculture here, we intend crops, livestock, forestry, and fisheries. Um, so this, um, this guidance note uh, really helped us because it outlined uh, se seven different steps uh, to advance uh, countries on developing the national m and &E systems considering that uh, different countries start from different starting points. So uh, we deal with countries that have uh, policies that are very well developed with regard to, for example, they have uh, a well-defined NAP for the agricultural sector. We have countries that already started in, uh, the work in uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation at the project level and trying to design a system to report at the national level. So, um, without going too much into detail in the different steps, but it's key to highlight that under the first two steps, um, it's important to understand the adaptation planning process. So, the policy context in which we operate, because the, the exercise of going through uh, the existing policies, the NAP, the NDC, the climate change strategies, the sectoral strategies, um, is useful to understand which are the targets and the objectives uh, to be monitored. Um, um, under step uh, three, um, um, it's, um, it's about understanding the scope and the purpose and the focus of the ME system. Uh, step uh, four, um, it's about the actual development of the system, which also includes uh, the, um, uh, the identification of the indicators, uh, the data, the information needs, and in particular the institutional roles with regard to data collection data management and uh, data analysis. Um, the m and &E plan, which is developed under the last step, um, helps the actual operationalization of the system. So basically help understanding the frequency of measurements, how to record the measure, how to uh, define a baseline um, who is responsible for using the results of the m and &E system, which is also crucial. 
So let's look at the concrete case so you will understand better how uh, these seven steps were applied into different countries. Um, in Guatemala, we have been working uh, um, very closely with, uh, this was a, um, a joint program managed by FAO, UNDP. So we worked with uh, the country-based uh, based offices of FAO, UNDP, and the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Environment. When I'm making this, I'm stressing this point because uh, um, the context specificity of adaptation requires um, very ad hoc uh, um, selection of the dimension to be monitored uh, that are country specific, context specific, but br very broad at the same time. Because when we talk about adaptation in agricultural sector, as you will see from the indicators, we really have to cover the different subsectors. Each subsector has its own priorities. So involving uh, a broad range of stakeholders was crucial. So let's look at the different steps. So on the step one and two, um, as I was mentioning before, we have done this uh, desk review of the national plans and policies. So we really screened the goals, the targets, the objectives, and the commitments of the organization, of the um, nation within the UNFCCC. Uh, so what is stated, what the country is trying to achieve under their NAPs and the um, NDCs and the um, national policies on climate change. Um, we have done um, specifically for uh, the agricultural sector because the goal was to develop a mere agriculture, which will, is the acronym from the Spanish, which is basically a monitoring evaluation reporting system. Under step uh, three and four, um, here you can see um, a simplification uh, of uh, the, 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 the MER system. Um, basically, the focus was on key agricultural subsector, as I was mentioning before, so agricultural lives of forestry and fisheries, with food securities as cross-cutting team. Um, this is because uh, this system basically was thought to help the um, tracking, the implementation of the um, adaptation agricultural component of the NAP. Um, but also, um, uh, under step three and four, we've done this exercise of taking stock of the information that the country was already monitoring, since the, the, the country had already two systems, two MNE systems. One for the, um, is, there was a planning monitoring evaluation system for the MAGA, so that's why in the figure you see SIPSE, it's the Spanish acronym for Sistema di Planificación, Seguimiento e Evaluación, and the, an emerging national system for climate change. Um, under step five, um, we continue the exercise by um, um, identifying, as I was saying, uh, the existing data and um, defining new indicators that were specifically important for tracking the adaptation practices. So the focus was on the implementation and monitoring of the practices that were already ongoing, either they had a budget, already budgeted by the MAGA or the MAR, the two different ministries or were already implementing the context of programs. Um. Under step uh, six and seven, um, this was uh, a key, you, in this picture you can see the institutional arrangement. Um, so it was uh, about defining the responsibility with regard to generating, gathering, and systematizing information, and how to use this information. So in the case of Guatemala, a key uh, point was the idea of using this information for um, at the operational level, so extension workers would have used this, the um, technical staff at national level within the ministry, so a strategic level, and the political level, so the high level decision makers would make use of the results of the ME system. Now, a um, quick overview of Uganda. Um, here we, you can see the components of the NAP for the agricultural sector and the performance dimension that uh, this ME framework intends to monitor. Um, I'm bringing Uganda because Uganda has uh, some interesting, uh, um, uh, um, it helped us uh, narrowing down some is a key element of success. Um, so it worked well because first of all, it was designed on the basis 
of extensive stakeholder consultation. Um, it was based, as was mentioned, be, uh, on this thought taking exercise of objective targets and practices, included indicators uh, that were measuring, they were already measured uh, within available data and, and so can be produced with minimum effort. Uh, was already, uh, was thought in the way to be um, already included, embedded in the existing m and &E framework and was conceived, and this is important, for reporting on adaptation at the national level and international level. So he used both this bottom-up, top-down approach in the sense that um, the consultation involved the people that would have been implementing the ME system in light of using the results to inform progress towards the design of programs and policies at national level as well as report the progress of Uganda in under UNFCCC processes. And, um, and also a key point was the definition of uh, um, the, um, the protocols for collecting data at the local level and the testing of uh, the system in practical terms. Um, that's all from my side. Uh, my, my, sorry, I had this last slide in which I am um, here indicating that if you read, would like to read more, we have three case studies on the work we have done uh, in Guatemala, Colombia, and a multi-country case study for additional reading. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elisa. It was very enlightening. I think we have time for a few questions. It was all very clear. Well, maybe I can start. I have a small question. So uh, this main meeting was a lot on the link remote sensing data and field data. And so you mentioned quite some indicators. So can you elaborate a bit on the data that was gathered with remote sensing? Do you have a view on that? How useful it has been? Is it more existing data from in the field? How? Yes, this is a very good point. point. So uh, in this system, uh, there wasn't uh, specifically the use of uh, remote sensing as far as I know, because it was all about using the information they were already gathering the extension workers in the field. But we are advancing with regard to this, because we are writing now a paper on adaptation methods and we are suggesting the use of some SDGs indicators, including those ones on forestry. And uh, the idea is really to use the information that FAO already does uh, and collect through the remote sensing and build. So the suggestion is to explain how to unpackage the global goal on adaptation, three elements of the global goal on adaptation, identifying the SDG indicators can be that are relevant for the national context to report on reduced vulnerability adaptive capacity and resilience, and within the SDGs indicators is monitored land use change, many of them make the use of remote sensing. So this is like forward looking. Thank you. To hear it because it's a very hard topic and a lot of countries really want to move into that. Thank you so much. I don't know if there's a country of question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. From the various studies and case studies you have mentioned, can you identify some key indicators that fit uh, maybe not all the situation, but are key to consider yes. uh, for, for adaptation policy? Uh, and could you also uh, give some flavor or example about how um, those national governments uh, consider those data and use them for further policies? Yes. Okay. So the, the, the both questions are very tricky questions because there is a, an international debate on which are the key indicators for adaptation. So this is like you are asking me to answer a question that is not answered in the international fora. But we can uh, suggest that we can identify some like general, let's say, metrics or classes of indicators that will help understanding whether you adapt or not and can be monitored that are meaningful if you monitor across uh, the, along with the climate data. So for example, uh, the status of the natural resources 
process and ecosystem because these they, they provide key ecosystem function and they are key for resilience and adaptive capacity so status of forest conservation for example or status of forest land use change so if you track some of the water availability or for example or status of conservation of genetic resources and then there are all the um, indicators that in the um, describes the uh, level of manage the implementation of management practices management practice with regard to natural resource management again biodiversity conservation there was today uh, this internet event super interesting event about the linkages between climate change and biodiversity uh, conservation uh, so all the management they implement the, uh, the level the level of efforts towards implementation of the national policies level of integration of adaptation in the sustainable development agenda uh, so the process indicator uh, outcome based indicator it really, the, it really, the span is very very broad as you can see um, so but in the paper we outline some of the key classes and metrics and, uh, and then how countries use the results. Uh, the, the results, if the results are, for example, with regard to the um, actual effectiveness of specific adaptation practices, for example, um, water resource management practices, I'm thinking about the dry uh, corridor in Guatemala, um, the, the degree of effectiveness of these practices within the current context of climate variability gives a sense of whether they, the, the implementation of your policies are working or, or not. And then there are, they are considered in light of future climate change scenarios. So how we are adapting at the, at the, at the, within the current uh, climate change scenario and whether this would be um, potentially uh, still feasible and effective in the long term. OK. Thank you very much, Thanks Elisa. So then to talk about international fora, I think this is a very international forum. And we have now the honor to have Marcel Bernou, who's working with us here in FAO, but who's also the IPCC uh, focal point. So he will talk about what Ad IPCC says on adaptation monitoring strategies. So let, me, let me start to save time. I'm taller than Elisa. So Inge kindly asked me to, to say a few words on what I know and how I PCC is taking this uh, of uh, adaptation. Just to say, so I am FAO, we, I, we work close with IPCC, I'm not the only one. Uh, Inge also was uh, associated, Amy and others here in the room. I know that you are also part of the IPCC process that it's quite a complex process. So I have only very few slides and I hope that the debate will be, perhaps the question will be also more interesting. So where is adaptation in the IPCC agenda? So just Back to basis, and just for all uh, to be fully aware, IPCC, you know, most of the time there is three working group. No, there is four working group. So, uh, and we have the name of the working group. So, on on the science, what we know on climate, the cause, uh, radiative forcing, so you know where the greenhouse gases are from. Then you have a uh, working group two that is really on adaptation on vulnerability. So you have already, you can see a lot of work on adaptations because it's not new. So the last you have uh, on IPCC, you can see below, they produce regular, the last line assessment report. So we have an understanding where we are in terms of adaptation globally per sector with some questions, cross-cutting issues and so on, framework that exist. So IPCC is doing some kind of compilation. IPCC is never producing new science. They are compiling available information. So what Vincent Elisa uh, presented is, is key because basically IPCC can take this on board. So basically, uh, this is utmost important that we have others doing the, the work. Then you have the famous uh, working group three, that was the last report on, on mitigation, where we are on abatement of greenhouse gas or also the, the sink part that for the forest sector is the uh, most important. And you have the TFI. On the TFI, the Task Force on National Greenhouse Gas Inventories, maybe one day we'll change the name, we'll see at the end, my last slide. Uh, it's to produce methodology, 
metrics, guidelines that can apply to all countries to have some common way to report things on common way to understand what the other is doing. So um, I, I will perhaps explain a little bit uh, later. So those three working groups work sometime together for special report. So the, they can decide there was a special report 1.5. So here at 1.5, the target Paris Agreement was mostly mitigation, but there was a special report on, uh, on land. And here all the working group was uh, implied on the T5 also. So you can have a different uh, arrangement between the working group to address uh, the, their different issues. Here you have, uh, I did nothing, it's not me. I'm wait a moment. No, 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 I did not touch nothing. <laughs> it's you, so if you need some positive vibes, this is a guy. <laughs> so it can work, but if you, we need you, so okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can see here on one sentence basically what IPCC is doing in terms of adaptation. So I, I will not read. You can read all. It's really simple. Trying to compile in different aspects, uh, state knowledge, tools, resources, what we have, and also planning, implementation, so on. You can have also some group. So here I, I put one task group. So you might remember some of you the TGK uh, that was one of the first group working on adaptation. That group was extinguished because basically also IPCC is following uh, new development. So basically that group have been reframed, reshaped with a new term of reference that is now the task group on TG data. So mentioning the importance also to have data on Elisa show, show, show that and it was the question we need data. So adaptation on what we're doing to face adaptation, to introduce uh, adaptation strategy, we need, we need data. So that's why that group is uh, very important. And also you have, that group is also responsible or have a link with the IPCC data distribution center. So all of you can also access the this is a data that were used to produce a report. So if you want also to do some kind of your own analysis to understand better, you have access to all those data at regional level, not at country level, but you can, uh, if you have an IT person, extract. It's not a, a very complex. But perhaps my only key message here, IPCC does not provide a one size fits all methodology. There is no methodology. This is, you have all have heard about a national greenhouse gas guideline. So there is one common methodology. So, but for adaptation for the moment, there is nothing. But when we look outside uh, IPCC, on the UNFCC side, because IPCC is an independent body, it's a science, but intergovernmental, but it reacts to requests of UNFCC. UNFCCC, this is the body that uh, deals with policy decision, binding decision on climate. So UNFCC can request or ask IPCC to develop something, then IPCC will develop, then up to IP UNFCC to decide what they do with. They will come, they use it, mandatory or not, so they can do a lot. So sometimes it's complex, but uh, so you have those two bodies. And there is a new a global uh, goal on adaptation. On UNFCC, if you look, and I will be short here, basically it was mostly, for the first 10 years, mostly on mitigation. Those are really moving also on a more holistic vision with embedding adaptation, loose and damage, uh, climate justice, or all those uh, different aspects that are also very important to face climate change. So now you have much more work than in the past on adaptation. On, you have the adaptation committee, so that is a body, uh, a technical body under the, the UNFCC umbrella, that try to address that issue of adaptation. And here I put only three reports, so with the link, I guess you can share presentation after. They are looking what we have in terms of methodology for assessing adaptation needs their application, a draft technical paper. So it's all public and you can see they are mostly all recent. They were produced just before the last uh, COP. And I was looking at uh, those reports. I just extracted one from one of the reports because it was also mentioning the FAO uh, 
And, 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 and in that sentence, basically, you can have a, here the essence of what all those reports are saying. It's possible to measure progress in a sector at a national scale. This can be done. You can have, and we have seen two examples, you, you can have metrics, you can develop at that. But to aggregate that at a global level and to have a common way to understand the other is very complex because adaptation is specific. A farmer will have, a farmer, a forester will have to adapt to its own circumstances. And from the other side of the valley, it can be different. Still, you have a regional level, but it's really, and this is, let's say, the tricky point you were mentioning, a huge debate. This is, that's tricky part, that is, we don't have magic indicator that can respond to all the different situations. We have a lot of different indicators. So it's how to build to, to assemble all those complex data, because then at the end we need the data to, to build something that can be useful. So for the moment there is no, but there is that wish, that necessity, because if you and FCC have a common goal, a global goal on adaptation, basically we need to track that. We need to be able to respond are we in the right direction or not? And then this we get down to the country. So basically they have to report. So it's, we are at the momentum where you were mentioning the debate, exactly, we need to solve that. So in the future, and here I put 20X, so I don't know, 20X. Uh, and also, you know, IPCC will have election with a new, uh, new, new chair, new structure. We're entering into a new cycle. So we will have a new assessment report, but also new special report, new methodology report, eventually that have to be decided by parties that are the same under the new FCC that might decide to call IPCC to do something. So I put here some ideas. So that might be not so stupid. In the future, we might see a UNFCC decision calling, inviting IPCC to develop or to co compile such common indicator metric gu guideline or to update at least some existing materials. If you look on special report, technical report, very precise report, a part of having adaptation in the working group too, you don't have really a specific report that is really recent on Adaptation, you have that one, 94, so it's not very recent. On uh, assessing uh, climate change impact and adaptation, you have another one, 2012, you have other report, or you have also report of technical expert meeting on that address uh, adaptation alone or adaptation in other contexts. So th there is a, a, a real need for developing a common framework, I will not say metrics, but a common framework how to assume the different metrics. And it's not only IPCC, and, and here we have also know the global biodiversity framework, so countries have to report also on biodiversity. You have under the UNCCD the land degradation neutrality target, so they have also, but basically countries are saying, okay, uh, fine, good to have a report on that, report on that, report on that, but it would be really more simple for countries to have a unique way to assign different aspects in terms of reporting where they can tackle different challenges with one structure that would be responsible to report. And I'm quite sure that some indicator, some metric can be helpful for both adaptation, mitigation, biodiversity, land degradation, and probably other agenda. So this is uh, what we need. So it's a call for moving all together, trying to put our brain working. So thanks for the invitation. Happy to respond to any question or not. It depends on the question. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marcel. That was extremely enlightening, I think, for everybody in the room, because uh, indeed we were talking a lot, especially in this forum of GFY, on the global, the national, the different scales. We all know that adaptation is really specific also on the local scale. So I don't know if there's questions from the room. Maybe Amy wants to say something. Oh. No, thanks to both Lisa and Marcial. That was that was very nice. Maybe a question related to the global goal and adaptation expectations for the global stock take um, on adaptation. That that tech, those technical dialogues and sort of what we will expect from the adaptation work stream by 
late November COP28, I mean, sort of any insight into that, because that's a, there has, something needs to be shown there. So kind of what insights you have on that process and what we might expect from, from measuring progress on adaptation. So on, on the global stock take, there is ongoing a call, a call for parties on the observer to submit their views on where we are and to update what they are doing. And it's clear that in the call, you already have the section of five section on one is adaptation on those one is on cross cutting issues that where you have holistic vision where adaptation fits well also. I cannot respond straightforwardly to a question because there is a lot of debate. Uh, it's really politically sensitive uh, because it's also related to land and degradation. Uh, but what is clear at the UNFCC level uh, on the global stock take or land and degradation that we need to find a consensus in terms of methodology. It's, how to say that? Um, when UNFCC was born with uh, the objective on, on greenhouse gas and mitigation, it was, let's say, a very top down process. So it was quite also easy to ask for common methodology to IPCC. And also mitigation is global. We can see the effect. You can inject CO2 today here and you will see the effect everywhere. So it was very global. On the adaptation on its pop up, also with a new way to see policy at a global level. The Paris Agreement is more a bottom up approach where you have every single country saying, I can do that, I can improve, but I will do this and I want also some kind of autonomy to say what I want to see in my adaptation part, in my mitigation part. And this now is being reflected at the level of the global stock state, or the, every discussion you have on, 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 on adaptation. Some countries are saying, because you have the Paris Agreement, you have NDCs, they will have to report. And you will have to certify uh, end of uh, December 2024 to have the first biennial transparency report where you will have to report on what you're doing on your action in terms of mitigation, in terms of adaptation, and also financing aspects. So adaptation is there, you will have to report. And some countries are strong in say, we should use the same approach as the Paris Agreement or it was built. So bottom up, every country will tell you, will report in a way. This has been superseded in a way with, now we have a framework for the BTR, for the reporting. But that framework is still too, too huge, not precise enough. You will report on some action, but we are not yet where we would be able to report at the really impact on. So it's very difficult to respond to your question. I guess this coming year, we, we will see clearly that uh, how we move from that new way to have a more bottom-up approach from parties, but with that necessity to have a common understanding on to where we are. Because basically, if you ask teams that are responsible for review, I guess you've already been part of an international review, and you are called when you have a, a document of a country saying, OK, I did that, and you have an international team, for, for them it's easy because they refer to international framework, international agreed methodology. But then if they have on adaptation reporting on the 200 countries, 200 different reports, 200 different ways, it would be impossible to, to handle. On a, so they need at least a way, a common denominator to see what they can say. So this, for me, there is no, no way back. We need to have something global, but this is the beauty of the complexity we will have to address oh, to, to build this. And I'm quite sure we have enough nowadays because we have data. We have plenty of data. We have never been so many data. We have a lot of satellite on the ground measurements. So, so if you look back with a kind of historical eye, what we have in terms of data per square meter on the planet in the past was nearly zero. And nowadays we have so many satellites looking at very different, uh, with different sensors on different aspects. We have monitoring system that are regional. We have, so we have, but we need to uh, find that 
intelligent way to assume that. On this, what will be boosted also by the financial aspect, because we have also the Article 6, you are all aware, I guess there is a plenty of discussion, and this is the same issue. Article 6, you will have to track and to avoid duplication. So it means national way to, to monitor, national registry, to share this registry with an international registry to be sure when you cross the border to not have double counting. So the way is here. We need to have national system in place to tackle mitigation, adaptation, Article 6, G, uh, global biodiversity framework, because uh, also the finance are not uh, outside, and they're more in that way and shrinking. So, sorry if not to have a more precise <laughs> question, but we really need to have a look, and I hope at least the global stock tech will say, hey guys, we have uh, that, but we need to reach that, and how to, to set a plan for the coming year on, with the global goal also on adaptation. Yeah. Thank you. Khaled Khawaldi from World Alliance of Wide Indigenous Peoples. Thank you for your presentation. I would like to ask, uh, I understand it's difficult when you are talking about how to work internationally, how to put the, the international standard, and of course, uh, when you are when talking about adaptation, we need to uh, think of the specificity of the uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. And um, is there any way to um, to adapt the tools that you are using to get the the knowledge from the uh, indigenous peoples and local communities? Because although they are scattered in different parts of the world, but the, we can say that they have can we can found like common or international local uh, indigenous peoples and local communities a standard that they can uh, standard that they can we can develop and um, also we need to uh, find a way to understand this knowledge and to uh, to uh, to adapt this knowledge or to combine this knowledge with the modern uh, knowledge that that we have um, of course, there's um, much of this uh, traditional or experiences or good practices there. Is there a way that um, through your work, I know, don't know how uh, you are doing this, but do you uh, try to find these knowledge or good practices and uh, combine it with your other work? Thank you. Yeah, here I can respond from OCB level, but I guess a little bit on FAO level because it's a Yes, it's a concern that it's a really cross-cutting concern. Yes, we have tools that are global, but we are trying to turn our tool more intelligent. Uh, and also, it's not we do not limit only to the tool. So we have uh, different tools. We have seen some tools, but we know that those tools are just tools that need to be part of also stakeholder consultation, stakeholder discussion at very different level from national, uh, uh, sub-national, and local. And when I was looking here at the global level, we need a global level to report. It will be, let's say, the country level. But within the country, it does not mean that you do not need to have a more complex system that will also be adapted to the different community or different context. And we need that because Whatever the country, it's not the same if you go on one side of the country to the plenty of country, you have a, a lot of examples, you have more than uh, one, let's say, one context, one socio, uh, social context, uh, environmental context, climatic context. Uh, so we need to do that. So uh, at FAO, people that are working with the different tools, and you have tools there that I can see, at least uh, Daniel here, is working on a tool, is adaptation, biodiversity, carbon mapping tool. So for instance, it's a, it's, a, it's a global tool covering all the world. But the idea is how to use this in a process where you will consult with people and bring people playing with the tool. When people uh, from Forestry, uh, Eric Lindquist team or other team, they are using their tools, they are not just behind the screen. They go to the country, they train people, they exchange their feedback, and they use the tool with people in the country, and this should be done at, because we need also to listen to people, because at the end, this is the people, and sometimes they are already implementing some solutions. 
And we need also to be able to catch that. So th this is your concern is really already part of FAO, let's say, way to approach that. But it's also part of the UNFCC. Uh, you, you know, we have a constituency uh, specific for indigenous people. There is a constituency for youth also, uh, uh, very important because people like me, okay, fine, uh, I am on my. Uh, halfway out already so but we have uh, incoming generation people that need really to uh, be the one uh, supporting the effect of what we did so <laughs> like that so on th that international process has already this also completely in mind but it's how to link the global to the local but when i say local it's very local it's it's very, most of people are really having few hectares or even sometimes less. So, auto-link that. This is a challenge. But it's possible. Thanks a lot. That's a very good start also to move now to the global. And hopefully, Antonio will bring some answers to all these questions. Or maybe some more questions. So we have Antonio Bombelli from the GCOS, and he's going to talk about the global climate observations for the adaptation monitoring. Yes, thank you, Inge. So maybe I can start trying to capture a couple of points from the previous two presentations that for monitoring adaptation, we need measurable and tangible indicators, of course. And there is this issue that Marcial underlined that uh, it's not obvious to move from national to global level because we will need a sort of uh, common indicator to be developed okay we don't have the answers the solution but we are trying to go toward that direction in the frame of gcos and uh, the gcos is the global climate of seven system and this work uh, is uh, the presentation from a small working group in the frame of G small i mean here you see the name so it's not my work it's a work of uh, several people uh, and i just jumped in in the last less than one year on that so very very few words because i think we are late about the gcos just to understand the context this is a co-sponsored program so uh, the main sponsor is the wmo the world meteorological organization of un then there is the unesco through the ioc the international graphic commission UNEP and the international scientific council uh, i think we can go to this slide where just to show again that gcos works uh, toward a global climate, or not towards, to support a global climate observations, uh, to support uh, starting from user needs, uh, uh, the improvement of the uh, the systems for monitoring climate, uh, to promote uh, free and open access uh, to data, and uh, probably one of the most important uh, uh, results are the GCOS implementation plan released every five years where there are actions, concrete actions to improve uh, uh, the global climate or service system that is uh, not the GCOS system, is uh, made by the pieces uh, everywhere in the world. Every international organization or, or even a national or regional level are uh, with the networks, the satellite system, they contribute to the climate system. And there is the ECV requirements, so I move back to the previous slides to show you that GCOS uh, is organized in three panels, scientific panels across the three domains of atmosphere, land, and uh, ocean. I work on the land and so the TOPC, terrestrial observation panel on climate, that is the more relevant for FAO for many reasons. And, uh, and the ECV, the essential climate variables are probably the most known GCOS product, I will say. There are 55 variables uh, across the different domains. And uh, for, for example, in the biosphere, we have uh, land cover, fire, albedo, biomass, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I mentioned probably the most relevant for the field. And, uh, and together with the GCOS implementation plan, it was released the ECV uh, new requirements report, and we will see something after about that, where, where they are the requirements, meaning the, at what resolution we need to measure a viable uh, spatial resolution, temporary resolution for climate uh, purpose, of course, because these requirements can change depending uh, 
depending the, the application and adaptation is one of these applications where the, our exercise was to see if uh, the current requirements for ECV fits for fit for 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 the application for adaptation purpose i mean and of course everyone is uh, welcome to contribute to, to the gigos implementation plan so moving uh, to the the work called the gat the gigos adaptation task team uh, uh, this was a working group to assess how current ecvs could be used or need maybe some modification to be useful for adaptation and uh, the, the, there can be two kinds of use of uh, climate observation so observation for adaptation so to, to to improve the understanding of climate change impacts uh, or observation of adaptation so to monitor um, to assess the effectiveness of uh, adaptation uh, strategies so this is uh, linked also to monitoring and evaluation framework that was showed also in the first presentation and uh, this working group worked on three different case studies on uh, uh, fluvial flood risk assessment in urban areas on ocean streams but the relevant one for this session and for in general for gfy is the forest wildfire of course this is a direct link to to forest and so i, I i'm going to talk about that and uh, so in general, maybe I have more or less said, so the, the, the main scope was to us to evaluate the suitability of existing ECVs for adaptation. And in case to identify uh, if new ECVs will be needed for adaptation purpose. Uh, so we mentioned also IPCC, the working group two, and uh, so, why forest wildfire i think is oh, as many others uh, uh, i would say expected changes uh, wildfires are uh, one of, of these that are, are expected the, the impacts of wildfires are expected to increase uh, because of climate change and uh, and then the the, the the perturbation caused by wildfires uh, range across for many different uh, level including uh, global carbon budgets from local to regional even global and uh, again and uh, and then but uh, let's have a hope because the uh, forest-based adaptation can be an opportunity to adapt to climate change and promote resilience so there is a, it was a, uh, decided as a case studies because there is an increasing risk due to fires but uh, uh, with forest management there can be a lot of opportunity to adapt and um, so the, the, the approach was to, to, to review more or less what are the current essential climate variables, so ECVs, what are the requirements, and see if these requirements are, are relevant or need some changes. So uh, th this group went through the, the temporary spatial resolutions uh, to see the adequacy of current uh, uh, variables and current uh, uh, observation systems to address uh, uh, specific adaptation needs. So what is more or less the result? We are still, in, um, I would say, in the middle of the process. Uh, let's see how we, we will move on. But basically, uh, here we have a lot of tables, uh, just to show you as an example. So the, the variables were divided depending on the, the potential application area. So for example, to, to, for, for the application, for detect files and, and their behavior that are um, the, the relevant ECVs were identified. There is an ECV called file, so obviously this is relevant. And uh, each ECV, each ECV essential camera variable normally is described by one or more product, meaning uh, specific variables that give you the picture of what is called ECV. For example, there is active fire or burnt area. Uh, there are two products of the ECV on file. And here you have the spatial resolution and temporal resolution for these two ECVs that were decided after a few years of work of the, I would say the whole GCOS community that is not the GCOS secretariat, it's the scientific community working with GCOS. Then there was an open review to everyone. So should be the, should reflect the, the current uh, capability at scientific level. 
And uh, here you see two different uh, scales. So there is G, B, and T means gold, black fruit, threshold. I mean, the, the, the resolution was divided in, at three different levels. The, the gold would be the highest desirable one that for common purpose uh, is, would be the best, but should be feasible, maybe not very in the in very short term, but not, should not be just a dream because otherwise it's not usable. Uh, and then the threshold is uh, the minimum level needed. So less than the threshold uh, probably is not useful at all for uh, at least uh, global climate uh, purposes. And so in some cases, uh, uh, these uh, requirements uh, were uh, evaluated uh, uh, good also for, uh, um, for adaptation purposes. In some other cases, where you see, for example, here, you see, yes, you see the arrow. Uh, for example, uh, the other ECB, ECB cloud properties, uh, uh, it was uh, assessed that a higher resolution is needed for the clouds generated by files, for example. So just to show you that the exercise done was at this level, so to review the current uh, uh, specifications for ECB and see if they are adequate or not for adaptation, and if not, what can be, the, the next work should be, what can be the, 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 the side uh, resolution. So you, you see this was done for several ECVs, uh, so I will not go through all the, the, the variable, but this report is available even if this still needs some, uh, it will be a, a little update in a few months. But at the end, 17 uh, essential climate variables were reviewed with more than 30 products uh, that were identified as uh, relevant for what fire application. And uh, as already said, in some case, they were considered useful. In some other case, uh, we will need uh, some, some improvement. And uh, some common challenge uh, from the, uh, the case studies of the GQS adaptation plus team, so not only for five, but more in general, uh, and some of these challenges were already raised in the previous presentation, is that adaptation is local in nature, while GCOS uh, is uh, global in nature, the G is global, so it's not easy to, to, to match and to move from from to downscale from global, uh, they be relevant also until the local scale. But uh, for sure, uh, the the global uh, maybe easier. The regional context uh, level can provide a uh, um, consistency context where where the local different local adaptation strategies. Maybe also there was uh, the other question uh, about how to consider the local knowledge, etc. So uh, to to contextualize uh, uh, the, um, the, the local knowledge at uh, global level, we need to move across scales. So this is uh, uh, for sure a challenge. And then the observational requirements uh, uh, can be used also, are needed also for uh, monitoring the streams. But I will just maybe say that, uh, uh, of course, resolution is space and times uh, uh, I mean, in addition to the higher resolution that we said, so I show you the tables with the space or spatial or temporal resolution, but we need also additional characteristics like homogeneity or long-term time series often are needed to, to, to have, again, consistency. Uh, or data in near real time that a global scale may be difficult, but a, a local it could be easier. Another point raised up is uh, the importance of reanalysis. So moving from available data, I also will say that we have really, there is often a lot of data, we don't exploit them. Uh, reanalysis is important, especially to, to close gaps in space and times. And uh, so it's also important work uh, can be used, reanalysis also for adaptation. And the additional uh, data, not necessarily climatic, climate related data are also needed when you work for adaptation. So GCOS is more focused on climate observations, but if we, we need to have the global, not the global, a complete picture, we need socioeconomic data, demography, environmental detail, and also the, the, the often, especially when you go at local level, you need to work more on interoperability to scale up, etc. And uh, just, I think this is uh, my last slide, more or less. 
uh, that what can be the stakeholders, the stakeholders uh, of this work can be, of course, uh, uh, national and local governments, uh, the national forest monitoring system that I suppose are also here, managers, uh, civil protection, of course, forest company, rural community, the insurance. And uh, I'm wondering, and you, I don't know, <laughs> some of you, you are from FAO, but some others uh, from GFI, maybe you belong to these categories or not. I don't know, maybe we can see. And uh, this is in principle is my last slide, but I close with this one because uh, there will be maybe you know in October this uh, big conference uh, in uh, Kigali from the World Climate Research Program, and the uh, GCOS uh, will have a post class session right on adaptation. So, I mean the the, the um, submission is closed, but if you are interested to to go, maybe not only for GCOS, there are many others. Uh, interesting sessions. Uh, okay, there is this uh, big conference. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Antonio, to show all the data and all these indicators. I hope the countries still keep the faith to do this. I don't know, we have time for one question, if any. No specific questions. Yeah, Flavia. Uh, the microphone is coming. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so my name is Flavia, and I'm, it's very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. So when I see the amount of data um, of when we are talking about adaptation mitigation, it came to my mind this new regulation on EU deforestation, right? So. How it's gonna be, how do you see the support of GCOs, of CPAO, of many other tools that we have available uh, to support these countries, for example, Brazil or smallholders to, to comply with this new regulation of the wood deforestation and degradation, not only deforestation, but we have this very complex component with degradation. Thank you. I don't know who wants to start. I pushed. <laughs> uh, those, your question mentioned tools, but tools are just tools. It's basically the way you use them. And what you are saying, whatever the legislation it is, you need to have a body to enforce or to check what you are doing. Most of the time, I would say that body need to be at national level. So if the concern is to follow deforestation, land degradation in a country, it has to be done at national level with some kind of level of independency, or at least showing that you're using science behind or not using, I guess, best. Uh, and be sure that then you have always international level to check back to ensure what the national level is doing is compatible or reporting numbers that are compatible. It's happened recently with different countries, I will not mention the countries, where you had a national number and you can see if, uh, what the international bodies are saying, if it's aligned or not. So, but the tools are just tools and you can use always the tools the way you want. So we should not never say this tool is the best, so basically saying the truth. No, the tool can be the best, and then you have very different view of the same tools. So uh, that's it. Uh, maybe I can try to say something on this line, probably. Yeah. Uh, I mean, probably there are uh, different steps. Before we should, there should be, you should identify variables and indicators to be measured. And then the methodology to use these uh, variable indicators to monitor, to verify, etc. Uh, probably the, 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 at the end, the tools that based on these indicators and this methodology can be used to support countries. And this should be uh, everything packaged, uh, as the rest of you said, in international, I would say, agreed context or something. So to, to be consistent, uh, again, from local <laughs> to global level. So there are different steps to be used. And just to close with GCOS, GCOS what more a level of variables indicators, so more at the beginning of, the, of this kind of chain. Yeah. 
First, I, I can use a good example. Under the UNCCD, so the Convention to Fight uh, Desertification and Land Degradation, there was a discussion of the land degradation neutrality and how, what are the best way to monitor that. And there was one of the indicators, the NDVI, so one of the index of greenness of, uh, and but basically that index in a global level, if it can go in the right direction, but you can have the same index if you look for some bush encroachment. So you will have your NDVI going in the right direction, but basically it's mean non degradation. So you always need that level of national level, stakeholder consultation, because you can always have also an indicator globally that can tell you, oh, we are going in the right direction, and people on the ground will tell you, no, we are not going in the right direction, because here it means something else than what you can see globally. So and this was a very good example. So under the UNCCD, they are really reflecting that, and it is said in their guidance, to monitor land degradation neutrality, you have global indicators, but you need some kind of ground expert level check, people check, stakeholder consultation to look at the result and to say, yes, it's like that or not really. So this is really important. Yeah, and maybe just to comment, uh, maybe from the real capacity building uh, field, like they call it, because I don't think the term is so nice anyway. Um, Oh, we also have Gabby here. So I think I'm a dinosaur of GFY. So we've been doing this capacity building for 15 years. And as you said, we used to do tool capacity. So we would go into a country. They say we want to learn about radar. We would come in with a team, not only us, also Silver Carbon and all the other uh, implementing agencies to train people on tools. I think um, maybe five or six years back, we stopped the tool thing also because the seed money for all this capacity building had dried up. So we were like, we want to start from a deliverable and we go back from that. So for example, then most countries came in, we want to help with forest reference level of emission level, for example, then we would go take the reference level with the country and work backwards to see. And then the gaps were filled with the tools, options, which are needed because I said by Marcel, there's so many tools. What is the best tool? There's not the best tool. The best is what a country can assimilate and institutionalize in the process. And that's something we learned by doing. And Brazil was one of the first where we had that huge capacity building. It's a pity Claudio just left because he was the starting on this. And so we looked on what they have and filled the gaps in the systems. Now, I think um, with Gapi here, so we had that country led planning, which you might have heard of in the GFOI meeting. So the idea is really, and I that's also my personal meeting, it's not a foul uh, opinion, um, is that it's time that the countries are in the driver's seat. And that's a bit what you were saying. So often implementing agencies would come in and say, this is how you can do it. But I think it's really time to have the long-term planning as Naikoa was saying it from the World Bank, the countries decide on the long-term planning, how they wanna do it and what they wanna do it. And for this, we have the country-led planning in the GFY which uh, Gabi here was one of the lead persons, to see what is needed. And it's a country to call in. And then calling in not specifically an agency or a tool, but a deliverable, something they want to achieve. And well, of course, it's, it's a new concept. It's quite a new concept. So it's also another option. So I think that's the a way we would go. And then, of course, linked with the global part, with the new indicators, and then whatever indicator is there, you know, especially if it's remote sensing, it can all be applied. But I think the shift in paradigm should be that it's a long country need planning because by coming in with an ad hoc one time goal on a tool, I said it can be good, but if you don't know how and how it can best be applied, it's uh, it's tough because we always we heard a lot about the turnover. We heard that there's no resilience in the country. We all know that if someone gets trained, they go to other jobs. But I think that's everywhere. It's also in developing countries. But to keep the resilience, if when a country has a plan, also a long term plan on what they want with the capacity building or with the incentive, I think this is uh, a way to go. Yeah, I don't know, Gabi, you want to say something specific? Yeah, Sorry, I don't, don't put you on the spot, but <laughs> given you're here on the country. Yes, uh, so we are a group working with the GFY. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we are a group of people working with in GFY, you know, to help countries. We are in the, the signing phase of the program, but we are here to talk to, to people from countries because we as a group want to uh, provide the the 
the tools they can use or develop also a new tools that countries are interested in to develop or to have for a long-term planning of their system, their national forest monitoring system. So anytime we can just have a coffee afterwards and I can talk more, a little bit more about it with the people interested. Thank you. countries so Gustavo thanks very much for joining us we don't want to put you on the spot neither but it will be nice to discuss a bit because exactly what Flavia what your question is saying and this is at least for Amy's team and the work we're doing we don't want to invent and come up with new tools or things whatever we only want to be at the support of countries and so this is also one of the ideas because we have so much experience at least for the forestry part on the NFMS to see how we can help like we were seeing before as Marcel was saying to not confuse countries and have more data, more systems, because it's already extremely complex. And also to have all these systems built, to keep them, to maintain them, it's a lot. So we're very pleased to have Bob Kazungu from Uganda. So it's nice to have Uganda because we heard Elisa already a bit about it, to hear what you say, what your needs are, how you see it. Um, if FAO has a role to play, maybe not, huh? maybe we can just watch and help in case it is, maybe it can be with the global indicators. So we're very pleased to have you and to have everybody of the country. So please feel free. So Bob, if you want to give you a few slides. Uh, good afternoon. A pleasure to be here this afternoon. What I'm going to talk about is actually not work that is done by me alone. I have. Uh, I'm part of the MRV team under the climate change uh, portfolio, although I'm from forestry, but because the climate change um, is very difficult for you to separate climate change from forestry, especially when we're trying to look at um, the complete package or set for MRV for reporting to the UNFCCC. So I'm part of the MRV team. And so um, when Inge requested me to say something about adaptation monitoring in Uganda, I was very pleased to request the team that specifically looks at that in the climate change department to work with me to prepare what I'm going to share with you. So I'm pleased to be here to share that part of uh, the message. Uh, I think there is some distortion here, but anyway, um, I will talk about the background to adaptation monitoring in Uganda. I will talk about um, what institutional arrangements we have in the country, the tools that we have so far for adaptation monitoring, and also climate vulnerability assessment opportunity for adaptation monitoring, because we've been talking about indicators. Indicators is one of the first things you do, you know, as you, when you frame the vulnerability, the vulnerability uh, assessment, then you look out for the indicators. So. We have an opportunity in the country that there is some work that has been going on uh, on the climate vulnerability assessment and has provided some indicators that we are now feeding into the system, the MRV system in the country. So just as a word background, I know this is a common, a common knowledge, but just wanted to connect this conversation with the UNFCCC, uh, NAPA programs, that the discussion started at the seventh conference of parties in Marrakech, Morocco. And also just to mention that uh, Uganda launched its NAPA, that is National Adaptation Program of Action, in 2007. And since then, uh, different sectors have been developing their own adaptation plans. And agriculture took the first step to, to, do, to do that. Other sectors have also been able to develop. Others are still continuing to develop. And from you know, the NAPA that we have as a country, we have eight areas of sort of like project profile areas, general project profile areas, which from which uh, partners in the country are now unpacking to deliver adaptation related uh, actions for the country. And this include uh, community tree growing, land degradation uh, projects, strengthening meteorological services, community water 
and sanitation projects, water production project, drought adaptation projects, vectors, pests and disease control projects, indigenous knowledge and natural resources management projects, and climate change and development planning projects. So those are sort of like broad project profiles that the country developed with their NAPA, with our NAPA, <laughs> because I'm from the country. Okay, and, um, and the, the NAPA implementation strategy focuses largely on enhancement of resilience. So this is quite important. And uh, it adopts an integrated programmatic approach to implementation of those interventions that we mentioned above there, the eight. But also the strategies of the NAPA rely on community and ecosystem adaptation in the most vulnerable communities of the country. And so when we talk about adaptation being at local level, that's, that's a powerful a statement because you can't deliver adaptation without the communities. So the full implementation will lead these communities to be more resilient to the impacts of climate change. That's how we look at it from Uganda's point of view. And so the urgent call, therefore, for us to be able to have evidence that we have delivered on this, we need uh, data, we need information, we need to capture this, but more importantly, we need to monitor that. So that's how we're looking at it uh, from Uganda's perspective. But then what is happening? I mean, in terms of the institutions, I think, just like many other countries, I mean, there is always the lead uh, for this process. And my ministry where I come from, and the climate change department that I work with, I'm from the forestry department, but the climate change department, you know, I work with them quite closely on a day-to-day, -day, more or less. We are responsible for monitoring implementation of all the climate change actions, adaptation and mitigation. And of course, with our NAPA, we also agreed that every ministry, department and agency has a focal point for climate change. And these are desk officers in every ministry. So these are the focal, the persons that are on a day-to-day -day, uh, interfacing with the climate change department or with the MRV team, especially if we are to look at the data issues. But we didn't only end at the national level. We have uh, lower local governments, like many governments. Others have provinces. For us, we have district local governments. So in Uganda, we have structured our administrative units in the way of the central government, then there are local governments, and then there are lower local governments, which we call sub-counties, and then there are parishes and villages, the lowest level. But so at the local government level, we have, and we have about 145 district local governments, so those are quite many, you know. But each of those has a natural resources department, and the head of that department, natural resources, is the one responsible for issues to do with monitoring climate change actions. And this has been enshrined within the National Climate Change Act of 2021. So that's quite important for us because then we know who is responsible for what. But in terms of the structure of our MRV, uh, very quickly, I want to let you know that when we got this support from the NDC support program of the country to develop an MRV system, we agreed that the climate change department takes charge of that, but then we select a coordinator for the MRV system who will be very well supported by a MRV information technology administrator. This guy looks at the issues of the, the rights to access, uh, trying to look at the quality controls of the data, uh, you know, giving rights of access and uh, rights of of, of picking information from the MRV system to other stakeholders, but they are supported by nodal officers. And these nodal officers have been, have been developed at the component level because each of the MRV uh, has components to which uh, we have broken into components, five components. One is on GHE, GHG inventory, and then mitigation, adaptation, climate finance, and then considerations for sustainable development goals. So these node officers are responsible for those specific uh, components and they feed the MRV IT administrator, uh, of course, with the coordination of, of the MRV coordinator with all the information that is required. And they have specific rights of access uh, to that system. And of course, all these are supported by a user group, a module user group that we have at lower levels, uh, district local governments and other partners, especially for activity data collection and entry into the system. So that is a summary of our structure 
our MRV system in the country. But in terms of the tools, we decided to have an integrated uh, national MRV system. And you can see the components that I've talked about with specific uh, requirements for us to deliver. And the one in red you can see there is what brings us here this afternoon. So the adaptation actions are part of uh, one of the component number three within our uh, integrated national MRV system. And uh, I would like to mention also that there has been quite a bit of work that has enabled us to, to continue picking indicators. For example, you might have heard of the Global Climate Change Alliance, the GCCA project, for example, which was implemented by FAO from 2007. We have another phase now. Looked at resilience of agricultural ecosystems and a lot of indicators capacity was built, including capacity of the teams that are part of the data acquisition teams for this system. So we have a lot of work in the background, in addition to the main uh, MRV system that is supporting the enhancement of uh, transparency and data acquisition uh, for, for this system. And so for adaptation actions, of course, we know that uh, the NDC implementation roadmap has developed priority adaptation uh, actions that we, we were looking at. We also know that we are responsible for tracking those adaptation actions, but most importantly, monitoring and reporting of those actions and, develop, and delivering results and communicating those results. But all that, of course, leads to uh, preparing an MRV report. The NDC report is uh, benefits from uh, this work. In terms of the National GHG Inventory Report, the National Communications, we have developed a third communication report. When you read it, it has, you know, it has some aspects of adaptation in there, by annual reports, by annual update reports, international financial and uh, technical support. Part of transparency requirements as well. Uh, sorry, yeah, thank you. So I, I just want very quickly just to talk about the climate vulnerability assessment opportunity for adaptation monitoring as well, because we've been talking about indicators. I mean, these indicators are many, generally. When you look at adaptation and unpacking, so many indicators. And, and, and so, just like I think I agree with um, the last presenter who said that the indicators are so many that sometimes you have got to prioritize them, you have got to pull out what works for you uh, as a country. So my ministry, in partnership with UNEP, has been implementing the Climate Vulnerabilities Assessment uh, a project with the main aim of identifying and measuring national climate vulnerabilities and to track adaptation efforts and resilience. And this project is coming to an end this June, just next month. But the key output of that, which is relevant for this conversation, are the indicators for measuring resilience at national level for all key adaptation sectors within the Uganda's national determined contribution. But the process of index development, I mean, this is, I'm sure, for those who've worked within the systems, or uh, have worked on the risk and vulnerability assessment across the globe, you know that we have those steps, requirements to undertake. And we're using mainly the, I mean, we're borrowing, of course, from uh, the UNDP KITE, Climate Action Impact Tool, and other tools to be able to, to harmonize and come up with this. So we first did, of course, a risk and vulnerability framing, and then selected uh, indicators, developed data collection and processing uh, tools, but of course, we also uh, have been doing some weightaging. This is just about trying to prioritize to weight each of these indicators, which one's more influential than, than the other indicator. Aggregation, do a, an index, did an index validation. And then, of course, we represented this assessment uh, within, uh, within this uh, risk and vulnerability assessment report that we have a draft for now. We are delivering this project. Uh, in the coming few, few weeks and closing it. I don't expect an extension anyway. But all that, of course, is supported by literature analysis, data collection from different uh, points of the, of the government, local government levels. We also, of course, try to highlight the importance of uh, those indicators when we're doing the weightaging. We also do, of course, um, use the weighted average techniques to do um, the aggregations 
reliability tests are quite important. And uh, of course, we employ GIS based maps and charts and tables to present this assessment in a more useful and more understandable manner. Not forgetting that the stakeholder uh, consultations that happen at different levels, but more so at uh, the risk and vulnerability framing uh, level to identify what are these risks. And of course, we then we categorize these risks through components. And then of course, we develop a criteria for selection of those indicators. And we, you know, we prepare dimensions and components of ambiguity based on the IPCC framing as guided. And then also the final selection of the indicators. But of course, all that is supported by other data collection uh, opportunities like the one I've talked about from GCC and other projects that we have. And, uh, you know, then we have a vulnerability assessment a report that I'm sure will be churned out uh, to the public in the next couple of, uh, of weeks. And the focus, I picked up this slide because of the indicators that are important. The risk components were then filed with four, the hazard, exposure, vulnerability, and sectoral data. And we proposed a number of indicators, as you can see there. I'm not comfortable reading all of them. But what I must say is that a number of these indicators have a relationship with climate change, uh, vulnerability, and reporting on adaptation. So I'll challenge you to have a look at these slides uh, to, to get an in-depth. I tried to pull out as much as I could from the assessment and the indicators that we, we selected. I want to thank you. Thank you so much, Bob, to show how it really works in the country. And thank you so much for sharing this. Um, unfortunately, it seems we were getting kicked out of this meeting room. Um, so before doing this, I really want to thank also the Indonesians who really provided us with a fully fledged presentation. So it's on the slides, it's on the platform. So I would really encourage everybody to, to look into the slides, unfortunately, because we don't also have technical assistance anymore for the presentation. So we have a few more minutes. So maybe um, we also have other countries. Gustavo, we got all the way you to get here. I don't know if you want to say something about Colombia wants to do, or maybe it would be great if you can just hear some key message from countries, what we can offer on adaptation. We heard a lot on the global indicators, all these existing things. Do you think what's the most crucial thing a country is needed, or you look to FAO or other implementing agencies or GFY to help you with? So Gustavo. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. Um, my work in Colombia has been centered in mitigation in the forestry sector. Uh, there are NAPAs related with the forestry sector in the country. Uh, there have been uh, different kind of actions uh, at the local level, uh, supporting community uh, work. Uh, and looking at a uh, value in the use of the forest and adaptation with the different changes of, related with climate change. And uh, one of the things that I have always wondered is uh, how to get quantitative indicators of, the, uh, of how effective is a different, it's a different NAPA or a different program related with adaptation versus another one. There has been a, maybe that's, that's a, as a general term, there has been a lot of resources put into adaptation, but how can you measure the success, the success? which one is a more, a, I don't know, it, it could be kind of expanded more and which one would have to need another kind of evaluation uh, is something that it's needed in Colombia and I guess in, in other parts of the world. There are qualitative uh, indicators most of the time, but I try to think that we could make together ways of looking uh, to, to quantitative indicators mm -hmm. with forestry. Mm -hmm. I sometimes believe that 
the different efforts that we have done in mitigation actions mostly have been centered in what uh, in deforestation actions. However, restoration mm. could be seen as a mitigation and an adaptation action. Mm. Uh, the increase in carbon stocks in, in forest and uh, in, can also be seen that way. Uh, and it could be also related with non-carbon benefits that could be associated with forests. Uh, and maybe those indicators that had been built in the mitigation sector, in red sector, can also be incorporated and also incorporated the safeguards and all the other uh, social and economic uh, uh, importance mm -hmm. uh, to kind of build a, a kind of process that could be mitigation and adaptation valuable. Mm. I, I just wanted to, to, to hear maybe the different ideas and the ways mm. uh, other countries are working in adaptation in the forest. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Yes, uh, I don't know if there's someone else who wants to say something because I think we really have to close this session. They really kick us out. The good thing is that we're all invited for a coffee break. And the other good thing is that we also have people to bring you there. So this time you won't get lost. <laughs> so I know Tom wants us. Antoine, you want to say something? Yeah. Thank you very much for the content uh, and all these discussions. Um, and I think yeah, adaptation so, um, certainly is Gustavo? kind of abstract and sometimes can seem something difficult to monitor because it's cross-sectoral because it includes processes that needs to link local to global. Um, and so I think it's a really interesting discussion that um, could seem sometimes very difficult or something not very tangible. But as you were mentioning right now, Gustavo, the very concrete practices are the ones that speak to building adaptation and resilience, you know, restoration, building uh, disaster risk management interventions. And so in that discussion, we've been, we put out a, a recent technical paper that I wanted to promote on forest-based adaptation, building upon the work of IPCC and recognizing that these are tangible, measures that are already operating that already work in the field and that need to be upscaled and so this is the kind of discussion that we're excited to bring here to the gfoi to try to transition to see also how can we recognize the contributions of forests and trees outside of forests to adaptation so thank you very much for the session and look forward to continuing the conversation with colleagues yes thanks everybody thank you.